Chapter 32 Speculations He who has imagination without learning has wings with no feet. Joseph Schubert 32.1 Capstone This chapter aims to place a capstone atop our explorations of the transportation experience. However, perhaps capstone claims too much. Speculations might be a better word. A simple statement over our objective is, learn to do better. That's quite a charge, for it bears on the abilities of organized societies to improve and adjust to changing conditions. What policies are needed to steer systems in more appropriate ways? That is, do better. In Chapter 10, we describe the magic bullet. Demand creates economies of scale that either improve quality or reduce cost, thereby increasing demand. This is true at a macroscopic scale and describes how technologies are successfully deployed. But moving from within the life cycle of a technology to the next technology's life cycle is harder. There are many kinds of systems and all are complex, so there is no silver bullet for that technology shifting problem. No single action fits all cases. What sets transportation and communication systems apart from others are their connecting enabling roles and the ways they provide so much of life. They are universal input industries, parts of social infrastructure. These features, we think, give special importance to our task, for doing better with these systems enables social and economic development. At the same time, the everywhere available character of these systems, coupled with lack of recent development, places many aspects of their problems and opportunities out of sight and out of mind. We said learn because one must learn the rules in order to use, bend, circumvent, finesse, or break them, as well as to have a sense about which ways to go. 32.2. Policy Debates Matter We have explored policy and policymaking as it has been sifted, sorted, and judged by political scientists and by transportation policy wonks, such as James Q. Wilson, John Hazard, David Jones, and Alan Altshuler. This exploration told us that transportation policy is a game that, with a little effort, anyone can play. The professional should understand issues, varied concerns, and work effectively in contexts where issues are debated and decisions made, so this learning about sizing up and participation seems, ipso facto, valuable. But we must also recognize that many, if not most, debates are about marginalia or miss the point because of poor process specification. Does one's effectiveness in such debates have merit? Yes is the answer to that question, when one takes the view that much progress takes place in small steps, and even though the debate may be off the mark a bit, it's about moving in the right direction. Consider this example of such a debate. The local mercantilism policy theme often gets simplified to job creation. Cost per job, the incidence of costs, and equity issues are debated. Those matters are important if, say, the debate is about tax reduction and other inducements for the location of a firm in an area. If the action at debate is transportation enhancement, a similar debate may occur about the jobs created to build and operate something, say an airport. This misses the point. Such jobs may represent a cost rather than a benefit to the economy. But one could argue that jobs created for facility operations have some positive correlation to the effectiveness of the facility. If a new airport creates jobs above what jobs there would have been without the new airport, it implies that the airport has increased activities in its service area and something good must be going on. Yet that argument is quite fuzzy. For one thing, decreased efficiency may require an increased number of jobs or increased airport efficiency may disconnect airport jobs from job creation in the service area. Other things may be said, but we have made our point. The example debate suffers from poor process specification and argument about airport jobs as an argument at the margin of the development process. To reconsider the question, does one's effectiveness in debates such as that just illustrated have merit? We said yes before, but we could have said no, or it depends on how the subject of debate is framed. We will strengthen our speculation by observing that there are opportunity costs when policies are debated and actions taken. 32.3. Pick Consequential Battles Debating and taking actions on low-priority or misspecified issues may sap energy and attention from more fruitful endeavors. Perhaps one can tar with the opportunity cost brush most of the debates responding to transportation energy and pollution problems and also debates focusing on transportation system management. The transportation experience attends to the structures that characterize transportation in similar public facility systems, to their growth dynamics and to the nature of decision-making within systems and between them and the rest of the world. We know that consequential changes in what systems do are rather rare, and are rarely part of personal experiences. We have learned that a consequential change in the capabilities of a system involves a change in system format, we know that a change in system format may occur in several ways. One way that format change occurs, for example, is when innovators 
put building blocks together into a new format, for example, container shipping. Another is when a change in component forces change in other components, as Jet Aircraft did. We know that a system format has a technological as well as an institutional aspect, and that the institutional aspect usually falls in place to match the technological format. That is why we emphasize technology as the instrument for change. That is not to say that there are no generic ways to understand institutions. After all, institutions result from learning, and they have behavioral characteristics. We have learned that once the system format is established, decision-making is more and more component and subcomponent constrained, and the likelihood that a change in component will force system format change becomes less and less. As the scope of available decisions gets more and more locked in, the priority for kinds of decisions changes. Near the end of the growth cycle, we shift from deployment decisions to operations decisions. This explains why system structure and behavior in transportation provide a context unlike the contexts in which many experienced technology managers and innovators have accumulated their deep understandings, and why mapping from their experiences to transportation is difficult. That learning can help us place perspective on day-to-day -day experiences. It explains, for example, why many departments of transportation privilege technologies for system operations. It also explains the author's opinions that the priority is not likely to lead to anything very consequential, even though there are lots of exciting and interesting technologies to be played with and used as building blocks. Policy and planning ought to be inquiring, exploring activities, ever opening new options for social and economic choices. They should open new pathways rather than mine out existing ones. The word consequential implies that the action should offer a factor of two or more improvements in the human condition. Resources for analysis and implementation are small. Apply them to things that will make a difference. To strive to understand how and why questions we have invested in seeking what the literature says. There are literatures on the history of science and technology, on the economics of invention and innovation, and on program or event-specific things, for instance, the Panama Canal. The literature does have a lot to say about what, how, and why, but the information is limited to parts of the system or to the economist's atomistic system. When we ask that something be consequential in the context of large system behavior, the relevance of the literature is sharply limited. The literature rarely analyzes large systems, such as transportation, as a whole. People do analyze things of consequence to large systems, for example, we know the Ford Model T story very well. What is missing is the connection of the analysis to system behavior, constraints, payoffs, and so on. Where does that leave us? It requires that we add to what the literature and our own personal experiences say. We urge the reader to make a liar of George Hegel. What history teaches us is that men have never learned anything from it. Consequential action, as we have defined it, demands thinking about the nature of transportation and its functions. In turn, that thinking suggests interesting work. We cannot resist the comment that conventional action hardly takes any thinking at all. 32.4 Conventional Wisdom versus Consequential Action Over the years, Garrison has spent many, many hours and days in meetings with experts. Here are some examples. Not long ago, he met with a group of about 20, including some policy analysts from the White House, to work out what, if anything, should be done at this time to begin to substitute methanol for gasoline. About the same time, he met with a group of about 40, mostly scientists, to recommend breakthrough technology opportunities for energy conservation. He has been in lots of meetings to talk about technologies for highway operations. Experiences such as these have accumulated into hundreds over the years. Topics have ranged from bus design through regional economic development to earth resource sensors. What do these experiences teach that might be useful to planning? In particular, is there anything that suggests more consequential planning concepts and methods as opposed to methods that help us do more than deploy a given system marginally better? The answer to this question is, not much. Although the experiences do provide a point of departure from which we have tried to craft ways of thinking. Each experience is different, of course. Even so, they tend to be at two extremes. In the first are situations where there is unquestioning consensus and the meeting achieves smooth conformity. An example is an experience several years ago dealing with how to incorporate energy conservation experiences into transportation system management protocols. The consensus was that TSM is a good thing to do, protocols already adopted were just fine, fine-tuning was the problem, Dullsville. It is true that if something consequential is going on, then conforming and doing better is worthwhile, but we desire to learn how to shift development paths and achieve more consequential outcomes. 
and cannot learn that from conforming behavior. Here, Garrison's past ideas conflict with his present ideas. Suppose we had been asked in the late 1940s whether the idea of needs studies was a good one. The answer would have been sure, all the states ought to do such studies because it will make the highway program a lot better. Needs studies were viewed as a consequential thing to do. In the long run, of course, needs studies locked in ways of thinking in highway development. In a situation like that today, we would want to do consequential things, but not in a style that locks in inquiring planning. Garrison's experiences on the National Academy of Engineering Committee on Transportation Advisory Committee to the United States Department of Transportation were at another extreme. The committee didn't conform to conventional wisdom at all. Nothing was taken for granted. The advisory committee comprised individuals who had been very successful in technology, innovation, and management situations. Members came mainly from the private sector, high-tech environments. Each person could speak from personal experience, and previous successes gave authority to what they had to say. Suggestions made by committee members were far from conventional ones. Compared to conventional suggestions, they had an out-of-left-field flavor. At the same time, suggestions obviously had a lot of insight and knowledge backing them up. The committee's work was not very effective for two reasons. First, there was a misfit between the successful and exciting experiences brought to the table and the inherent nature of the transportation system. There was lots of talent at the table, evidenced by the major accomplishments of the actors, but the talents just didn't fit transportation. Second, the reason that successful experiences and rich insights could not be transformed to transportation was because while committee members had good intuition on what might be done, they did not have systematic ideas about how and why things might be done. They had rich insights that couldn't be transferred. It takes how and why knowledge to transfer insights from one field to another. Other experiences cluster toward either the TSM energy planning or DOT advisory committee extremes. By definition, most people's thinking conforms to conventional wisdom, often reflecting government programs. If DOT says it, therefore it is important. Similar experiences are formed when general technology, policy, planning, or other topics are the subjects. Such conversations are often impression-based and, in contrast to talking with experts, tend not to be deep. I think dominates with little authority experience to back up the I think. Often, even the insights and hunches aren't very good. As a result of these experiences, we conclude that conventional conforming behavior is wrongheaded, that unless experts have a track record backing up their insights, as was the case on the DOT Advisory Committee, most I think statements are to be disregarded. Where the speaker's record says one should pay attention to insights, they can't be used very well without good understanding of why and how questions. 32.5. Interest groups are socially constructed. Where you stand depends on where you sit. We have also undertaken the daring and little attempted task of looking beyond what some sages say. We examine the full modern transportation experience. We asked what the railroad experience says about the logic of policy, and then saw that logic working in other modes. Why did we explore in this fashion? We have already said that one has to learn the rules, and exploration of the full experience flushes out the rules. It ought to be apparent that there is much more to the rules than what is found in the current literature and topical debates. Perhaps Friedrich Nietzsche's remark is appropriate. The surest way to corrupt our youth is to teach them to hold in higher esteem those who think alike than those who think differently. And we have sought to interest the student in thinking differently and questioning those who think alike. Those who think alike may be thought of as holding conventional wisdom. Those who think differently are not so taken by conventional wisdom. To illustrate this point, consider the rather large literature on decision-making relative to policy. That literature emphasizes interest groups and the structures within which interest groups seek their ends. It's rich in the sense that trade-offs, side payments, and other such interactive and behavioral dimensions are introduced. Without denying the usefulness of the literature, we would raise that point that interest groups are not God-given. Their roots have to do with what we have called the national political ethic, transportation system structures, particular development paths, and other things. We think that understanding the evolution and shaping of interest groups is rich from a causal point of view, for that says how and why the die is cast. How interest groups behave doesn't reach so much to the heart of the matter. That's not conventional wisdom. Interest groups are socially constructed, and how and why are the first questions. To illustrate that speculation, consider the difference between inland water policy debates and highway policy debates. The stage, the die, to reuse the word, tells us the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is very much a player on waterways matters at the national level, while the highway establishment is relatively a lesser player 
felt at that level and more of a player at the state and local level. The explanation for the differences involved the French engineering status style of the Corps and many other things. Consider the groups that support and oppose road pricing. Where do they lie on the conventional political spectrum? Recall that social constructions are shaped by technological evolution. 32.6. No decision is truth. Many roads lead to Rome. Another speculation is conveyed by the there are many roads to Rome expression. We saw the difference between English, French, and U.S. policy styles, and one can imagine how styles in other nations relate to those differences. Each style has its advantages and dysfunctions, and these may be debated. However, the bottom line is that many things turn out more or less the same, regardless of the road taken. Many roads lead to Rome. There is no single correct way to proceed, conventional wisdom notwithstanding. Linear reasoning yields conventional wisdom. To this point, we have discussed conventional wisdom at a very broad level. Conventional wisdom assumes a mythic level. A first-glance interpretation of why this is true might go this way. First, something seems obvious, therefore it's true. When we ride a bus, there are more riders on a bus than in a car. Therefore, a bus is more energy efficient than a car. Second, we are lazy and don't bother to go beyond the obvious. What about the times when there aren't so many riders on the bus? Because only a few people are acting as observers, it follows that low ridership is less likely to be observed than high ridership. What about deadheading, thin collector distributor service, etc.? Third, one can add the underscoring of the obvious by advocates and the inherent difficulty of rebutting the obvious by those opposed to an issue. While this line of thinking may apply to cases, we think it oversimplifies the situation and is pessimistic about the ability of individuals to think about things. Ordinary life experiences say you can fool some of the people only some of the time. The calculus of reasoning yields conventional wisdom. We reason using symbols, metonymy, and metaphor to turn complex situations into common sense. This obviousness leads to ends justify means programs and to incarnations of moral imperatives. Good versus evil is easy to see. That's how automobiles and highways became peccable. Mass transit became good and worth achieving no matter what. What's the bottom line? Metaphors are useful, but they can trap us. For instance, the system life cycle is useful, but we should be wary of the inference that maturity is inevitable and that maturity halts development. 32.8. Policy and design would be improved by bridging the soft and the hard. Should hard or soft technologies be emphasized? Which aspect of technology, the hard or the soft, is instrumental in leading off change? It is important to have a clear answer to that question if we wish to use technology as a planning instrument. Consider how the rail system came about. The steam engine, coal, fuel, tramways, and so on came together into a workable system format. That workable format called for soft operations, financial, legal, and institutional technologies. That took about 15 years, and when the hard and soft were in place, the system was ready for deployment and the changes in technology that deployment required. Such a discussion is neat, but we do not regard it as sufficiently deep to serve our search for causality and critical instruments. The reason is that it does not deal with what was behind the first step. What caused the building blocks of the steam engine, tramways, and so forth to be melded into a system? Those building blocks were ripe for use. The technology was ready. But they were melded into a system by wise innovators in particular situations and for particular social and economic purposes. That reaching for why says that the soft side is of interest, along with the building blocks or tools. Indeed, the first question is how and why people do innovative things. This observation changes the question. It is not a matter of emphasizing either the hard or the soft side of a technology. Interest must be on the process through which the hard and soft are birthed. The innovation process, that's where to start. It is not news that there is considerable chasm between thinking in the social sciences and allied fields and thinking in the physical and biological sciences and allied fields. It is also not news that the policy world divides into what, for shorthand, we will call hard and soft. Energy, aerospace, defense, and health policies are largely framed by hard thinking. Welfare, education, trade, international relations, antitrust, and some other policies by soft thinking. The chasm is illustrated by energy policy. By and large, it is dominated by hard thinking, and the creation of more efficient technologies is the objective of policy. Soft policy mainly addresses constraints on demand. Bridging or merging the soft and the hard would vastly improve policy and policy-making processes. That point is somewhat obvious, and it fleshes out very well when we remember that progress is achieved by design and through design. That's just saying that what we have said elsewhere using the expression such as putting old things together in new ways, 
It's true that most of our discussion has used hard language to describe creating the new. That's an easy way to transmit images. At the same time, we have striven to include the soft sides of designs. It needs to be emphasized that the progress by design notion isn't just a notion held by in hard arenas. Sanger and Levin, 1992, make the point that administrative and policy innovations follow from the assemblage of old stuff in new ways. These are words very similar to those we use. They go on to say that the sequence aim, fire, ready is the one that works, and we see this observation close to our emphasis on trying things out. What about achieving bridges between the hard and soft worlds? Many would say that economics permeates policy in both worlds, and that is the bridge that needs to be strengthened. That's true, yet we have some problems with the economics emphasis. For one thing, that connection has been present for a long time, and the hard and soft are still worlds apart, so to speak. Indeed, both benefit cost and consumer surplus ideas evolved in transportation contexts. Economics can be said to serve a checklist role for testing the economic feasibility of hard proposals. That's a limited role, and there's no counterpart, a checklist for the hard implications of soft thinking. The creation of designs would provide venues for merging hard and soft thinking. 32.9. Ideas are like baggage. Next to the originator of a good sentence is the first quoter of it. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Quotation and Originality. Good artists copy, great artists steal, Pablo Picasso. One of the surest tests of the superiority or inferiority of a poet is the way in which a poet borrows. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. The good poet welds his theft into a whole of feeling which is unique, utterly different than that from which it is torn. The bad poet throws it into something which has no cohesion. A good poet will usually borrow from authors remote in time, or alien in language, or diverse in interest. T.S. Eliot, Philip Massinger, The Sacred Wood, New York. Without innovation, nothing would happen. Without imitation and replication, the innovation would stay localized. Imitation is a critical component of the development process. As important as the initial creation is the decision to copy or steal it. There is a major difference between copying, which is simply adopting the external form, and stealing, assimilating the underlying logic. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computer, embraced this quote, arguing in essence, if there were a great idea, why wouldn't you steal it and make it your own? Jobs also said, real artists ship, meaning that the product must actually be delivered, not simply reside in the minds of the engineer. Ideas are light baggage. News about good ideas can spread fast and far. Within a few years of the development of the first steam railway in England, imitators were developing others in England, on the continent of Europe, and in the United States. As ideas are imitated, they may be re-engineered or reverse-engineered, resulting in different implementations. The new instances are recognizable as deriving from the original, but they are no longer exactly the same. American steam railways evolved to take into account American circumstances. Chicago area transportation study rooted urban transportation planning methods were adopted worldwide in about a decade. Private sector like arrangements for government activities are spreading. Tolls in Singapore are emulated in Rome, Milan, Stockholm, and London. The technology for the manufacture of gunpowder seems to have migrated to Europe before Marco Polo's travels. The list is long. But there is the problem of counterexamples. Ideas about road technology and road programs didn't seem to migrate from France to England very well though canal technology did. The English read the fate of canals and toll roads versus railroads very quickly, but that reading didn't seem to migrate to the United States very rapidly. So the notion that ideas are light baggage needs some tightening and interpretation. Can we interpret the notion by examining the carryover to later times of ideas from the English pre-railroad experience? The equity issues associated with toll road development and use were mentioned in our discussion. Were those issues light baggage? In a short time frame, they certainly were. The evolution of railroad commodity pricing and parliamentary trains responded to those issues. In a long time frame, however, those ideas have not proved light baggage. We didn't mention environmental and property rights issues very much in our discussion. To augment the discussion, we note that the first enabling road relocation carefully specified that no gardens, lawns, or structures should be taken for road use. Parnell, 1837, was concerned about such trespassing. Our conclusions about environmental and property issues are similar to the equity toll issues. In the short run, ideas are light baggage. In the long run, they are lost. Experience of earlier debates seems to be forgotten. Few anticipated the vigor of environmental debates, and no one seems to remember how previous debates were resolved.
32.10, Transportation Provides a Mother Logic for Society. We said that the railroads provided a mother logic for modern transportation systems. The transportation experience provides a mother logic useful beyond the transportation context, a logic useful when interpreting political attitudes, institutions, and many other things about society. A simple reason for this is that transportation systems are large, touch on all of life, and are omnipresent. Caveats are needed. We said a mother logic rather than the. Also, we should think of the realizations of systems as a result of interactions between systems and society. As systems were developed, they were a venue for learning, shaping, and framing. The Pennsylvania Railroad as a model for the modern decentralized corporation was mentioned. For the rail mode and other modes, a long list of other such models may be identified. Use of job descriptions, provision of health care for workers, retirement schemes, rule establishment and rule following, the union movement, designated inspectors, standard-setting institutions, and so on. Our discussion made much of local entrepreneurship in the interest of local competitiveness and the evolution of constrained capitalism. Are there other themes at this broad level? Alexis de Tocqueville stressed the tension between the individual and community in American life, and transportation was certainly a stage for the play of those themes because local mercantilism required a community base and community actions were needed, for example, for the provision of road systems. For this reason, one might suppose that community was shaped by transportation. Yet transportation and communications decreased the tyranny of space and the sense of place as a base for action. As Weber put it, we now live in a no-place world. The sets of interactions of individuals and institutions span long distances and transportation and communications have yielded placeless community. It has weakened traditional community based on place. At the same time, it may have strengthened community based on common interests. The transportation communications community relation has changed over time. 32.11. Transportation regulatory agencies provided a mother logic for regulatory government. Recall that while government planned and financed transportation improvements in the 1800s, the experience was unsatisfactory because of misuse of funds, shoddy work, and other ills. This experience translated into a suspicion of big business and played a role in the move to constrain capitalism. It seems to have been widely understood at the time that the fault was partly with government. Governments were small, consisted of many elected persons with few skills beyond politics, tainted by bribery and had other characteristics limiting abilities to understand, monitor, and control private organizations. Among other things, this situation in the transportation experience laid the basis for the progressive movement that swelled in the early 1900s. It also swelled because of the increasing interest in scientific management. Governments were to have expert bureaucrats on board equipped to run government in an efficient and equitable way. Government procurement rules, civil service laws, personnel programs, and so on followed, the implementation of progressive government was speeded by expanding road programs and public health programs, where the meaning of expertise was clear and diffused costs and benefits asked for equity. Transportation problems and programs seeded and nurtured government by professional bureaucrats, a point made earlier about government's learning about regulation. How did the transportation experience steer today's intergovernmental relations? We speculate that there was a lot of steering, even though the relation often seems fuzzy. Consider the growth of federal power. The up-the-hierarchy movement of government power and transportation began with the nation setting port charges, favoring U.S. ships in the coastal trades, in the early 19th century, Army Corps of Engineers programs in the mid-19th century, and the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in the 1880s. Power moved up the hierarchy and other programs subsequently. Did the transportation experience influence those programs? We can find cases where the answer seems yes such as the use of federal grants to steer local programs. But the link seems weak in other cases. Along with power moving upward, there has been an increase in the size of the federal establishment. Today, the U.S. DOT has some 63,577 employees. There is also the state and local government partnership characteristic of programs. Developing early, the transportation experience, especially the highway experience, must have affected partnerships that came along later. But how poses a larger question. The answer to the how question is fuzzy in part because the transportation experience was a very diverse one. For example, the Army Corps of Engineers program development experience was very different from the highway program experience. 32.12. Transportation opportunities enable innovation in the economy. 
For completeness, we need to include the companion innovation speculation. Transportation improvements open opportunities for innovation. The pursuit of those opportunities steers development generally. 32.13. Transportation is bound by a social contract. We have said that government policy formation and implementation has in part a default character, and we noted government actions in instances where the embedded policies of the railroads could not meet the needs of the properties or manage their problems. We argue that government actions are also taken when system services fall short of social expectations, that is, when the social contract is broken. To deal with transportation's relations with society, it is useful to think of a social contract. Society is one member to the contract. Members of the population in social and economic institutions hear about and or experience and learn what transportation can do. Expectations develop. Service providers test the market, and they gain a sense of what is expected of them. In a sense, a kind of contract emerges, a social contract, and problems arise when the parties to the contract no longer honor it. For an example of a contract in trouble, today's highway establishment upset Today's highway establishment is upset because the public is no longer providing the money to continue with business as usual. The public is unhappy too. Facility providers are no longer providing a better road system. The social contract has been violated. Speaking especially to highways, David Jones put the matter this way. Transportation development is a contractual phenomenon. At its core is a negotiated agreement about what to build and how to pay for it. This agreement has the character of a social contract. Transportation development can proceed when there is agreement on what to build and who shall pay. It falters when such agreement erodes. Transportation development is also a technological phenomenon. Progress is made as improvements in technology are introduced, perfected, and built up into systems. The introduction of successive technological improvements, developmental progress, hinges on successful adjustment of prevailing agreements on what to build and how to pay for it. In turn, sustained development hinges on renewing that agreement in successive rounds of investment. Each round of investment reopens the question, what to build next and how to pay for the next increment to be added. Without renegotiation, consensus erodes and development falters. And Jones sees political actors as negotiating successive rounds of development investments. We like Jones's discussion, but would not want to restrict the notion of social contract to instances where the contract is formally negotiated or those where there are successive rounds of investment. We think of a contract's existing if what is being done is acceptable to both parties. Things are copacetic if the it ain't broke, don't fix it rule is holding. 32.14. The life cycle dynamic of systems strains social contracts. For example, as long as a system is in a deployment phase, service improves and expectations increase. Growth by deployment results in access to ever-increasing markets and social opportunities. But once deployment is complete, Service providers cannot deliver expected improvements. Growth slows. Profits return to normal. All customers are served. At this point, companion innovation slows down until the next technology comes along. The social contract implies that society will serve the needs of its members. With respect to the physical facilities used by the public, needs are recognized by observing how users behave. The physical dimensions of needs are then defined through analysis. Geared to efficiency, safety, and other goals, the effort is made to provide for needs in desirable ways. We see cars consuming numerous gallons of gasoline per day. We count the traffic on a highway route, or we observe how travelers check in at an airport. The professional regards such be behaviors as needs and strives to define them in physical terms. The latter, the definition in physical terms, is often stated as the need. We need an M meter wide pavement of P centimeter thick Portland cement concrete on route R at time T. We need N open ticket counters for flight XXX. Highway planners today are observing the growth of the suburbs. Tomorrow's needs are for suburban facilities. While the definition of physical facility needs is less than perfect, there is no doubt that there has been steady progress in responding to needs defined this way. Compared to other wealthy nations, the United States does a pretty good job of meeting needs. Unlike needs, the notion of wants has not been well operationalized. Wants is a vague idea. While needs may be limited, wants are practically insatiable. In the mythical, purely atomistic world of The Economist, there is market clearing. The goods or services that consumers want get turned into needs, things purchased, through a calculus that balances preferences, disposable income, 
supply and demand relations in aggregate markets, and prices. How well do wants get translated to needs? That depends on lots of things, with the level of disposable income being critical. The rich can get what they want, the poor do not do as well. Taking one step back from a static market situation, how well do the goods and services supplied track on changing wants? In the atomistic world, there are innovators developing new products to replace the old. There is a constant exploring of ways to meet old and new wants. Successful in the market, new products or services displace the old. The new, responded to in the market as a need, matches wants better than the old. Something needed before is no longer needed. The market tells me there is, a, there is little or no need for buggy whips. Now there is a need for GPS-based in-vehicle navigation systems. At least that's the way it's supposed to work in the private sector. In the public sector, the lack of fit between the ever-changing wants of publics and needs as defined by suppliers gets treated through political markets. That process works to some extent. It has some distortions, of course. Publics with intense interest in some want can get that turned into a general need. For instance, there are those who intensely want American jobs in bottoms and coastal trade. Therefore, the nation needs Jones Act protection. The private sector style innovator exploring new ways to meet wants is generally absent in the public sector. When an activity is identified, interest is mainly in more efficient ways to meet wants. It isn't in new products or services that displace the old in the fashion that we imagine in the private sector. The planning style suggested is aimed at stimulating innovation in the public sector, transportation in particular. The innovation of concern is market or wants exploring. We have suggested that the private sector provides a model for that kind of innovation, but that's arguable. The private sector is less than perfect. Some private sector managers have little use for thinking about new things. Others, like the reasonable man in the Shaw quote at the head of the chapter on innovation, section 4.10, accept the world as it is and concentrate on playing the cards they hold. And some let others innovate, assuming that they can produce a look-alike that's better. Let others take the risk, after all. The pioneer is the one with the arrow in his back. In the early days of the life cycle of systems, two questions are explored. The first concerns supply. What technology designs are feasible? The second relates to demand. What do publics want? New systems meet wants rather than needs, as real needs have already been satisfied by older systems. The social contract says that when satisfying new wants, don't unsatisfy old needs. This is in line with the notion of undertaking only Pareto improvements, those that make some people better off without making anyone else worse off. The problem arises when ensuring steadily improving conditions, or ensuring that everyone achieves proportionate gains, appear as needs rather than wants. 32.15. Transportation tomorrow will resemble today. We have mainly been looking back. We have seen how the policy planning, deployment, and management tasks changed as modes ran out their life cycle dynamics. We also look back at ideas. We have also seen how techniques have evolved. Looking back has an element of looking around, for we look back using today's perspectives. We interpret what used to be using today's perspective. Looking around, we see that much has been accomplished. Most everywhere, systems are safer, more reliable and accessible, cleaner, and so forth. That's in spite of the growth in demand, and the many who predicted disasters just around the corner because of shortfalls of capacity. Looking around says a good bit about looking ahead, for tomorrow we will be reacting to today's ideas and problem statements, institutions and policies, and social and economic trends, as well as the running out of the life cycle dynamics of systems. Assuming that progress similar to that we are making today continues, tomorrow will be abolished today, assuming away the possibilities for war, depression, violent social conflicts, disease, and sudden ecological disasters. A major reason that tomorrow will be much like today is that the turf is occupied by legacy systems. There are the physical systems, highways, transit, airports, and so on. Institutional and financial arrangements are there too. Metropolitan planning organizations, congestion management agencies, fuel taxes, state agencies, and so on. And there is an endless list of things ranging from legal arrangements to protocols for construction contracts and the job descriptions of transportation planners and workers. Legacy systems change slowly. Institutional inertia bears on the continued life of legacy systems. But we think social contracts are the strong glue that says that legacy systems will continue into the future. It's decided to do something a certain way, and that's the contract. Consider the every five year or so surface transportation bill as a social contract. It will stick in ways regardless of what Congress does. First, there is the cost of contracting, getting the legislation. 
It takes years, much effort, lots of horse trading, side contracts. The bill occupies the intellectual turf as the solution. And other solutions have to find a place to spawn before pushing aside the current wisdom. Although it may not be so great in the case of a single pork barrel laden surface transportation bill, most contracts have ethical implications if they are broken. People get hurt. The social contract is often described in terms such as those applying to jobs, rights to education and welfare, and security. It really is much broader than that, for it shapes the accepted views of problems and solutions. It grandfathers things. We are observing that actions are constrained by contracts. However, a naysayer might comment that contracts do get broken, for example, as corporations downsize, and that Congress is engaged in massive contract breaking, downsizing and devolution, welfare, education, environment, and so on. That's true, and it underscores the cost of contract breaking, as well as the role of imperatives when contracts are broken. Competition is the imperative in the marketplace, and the national debt is the culprit in the government case. We wonder if the use of a highly metaphoric language in transportation is a dysfunction. We speak of arterials, bypasses, transportation, housing balance, and many other things using metaphors. Does this limit the scope of planning actions and affect the way that tasks for planning are identified? The disjoint character of systems is another dysfunction. It constrains the way systems are conceptualized and thus constrains the ideas for improving planning. The situation is worse, however, because turf is occupied by ideas of limited effectiveness. They translate to techniques that are similar to hammers. If that is what one has, everything looks like a nail. In this kind of world, research is involved in a positive feedback spiral where increasingly inefficient research becomes the training ground for each new generation of research workers. Forrester and Brown, 1975. Finally, life cycle based processes play a large role in defining the stage and thus how ideas are shaped and techniques used. With respect to the life cycle, one presumption is that things will go along as they are. Maturity and stasis continue. Emphasis on transportation management is one result. Among other things, there is fine detail mining out of opportunities, such as opportunities to develop HOV lanes or park and ride lots. Another feature of maturity is that institutions are very conservative and risk-adverse, as well as being very process-oriented. At the same time, achieving scale economies in actions is critical. That's partly to reduce risk. It is also a requirement for being competitive. Facilities such as the new Denver Airport, the Channel Tunnel, and high-speed intercity trains are very risky, and a critical question is, will they achieve necessary scale? Within urban areas, people movers and rail transit investment have faced the scale question. There is the option of breaking the tyranny of the existing life cycle. That could happen as the result of inventors and innovators creating new technologies that break the dependence on old systems. An alternative would be to implement planning and policy to break the tyranny. What is surprising is the number of project starts made even when it was already clear that a superior system was replacing the system being planned. This was the case for many canal projects in the United States. Investments were made even though there were ample hints of the potential of railroad competition. The competition dynamic says that plans ought to consider what the competition will do, as well as considering strategies for decline in the face of competition. The inability to break away from legacy systems places a curse on posterity. 32.16 all nations are both developed and undeveloped concerning transportation. For we already live in the openness experiment, and we have for 200 years. It is called the Enlightenment, with light both a core word and a key concept in our turn away from 4,000 years of feudalism. All of the great Enlightenment arenas, markets, science, and democracy, flourish in direct proportion to how much their players, consumers, scientists, and voters, know in order to make good decisions. To whatever extent these arenas get clogged by secrecy, they fail. David Brin David Brin argues that the Enlightenment experiment has been about positive sum games and open competitive economic markets, science, and democracy. Free movement of people and ideas is a critical enabler of open science, open markets, and open democracy. That movement is made free by policies such as those that allow migration or eliminate tariffs, but it is also made freer and lowered in cost by new transportation and communication investments that allow more to be done with less, more travel in less time, or at lower cost. In a similar vein, Ferguson, 2011, credits six killer apps or social developments that set Western Europe and the Americas on a faster growth path than the rest of the world. Competition, science, property, medicine, consumption, and work. Peter Gordon has suggested adding positive agglomeration and network economies to that list, which are of course enabled by relative location of activities to each other and the transportation between them. 
Although there are gradations, it's useful to speak of three types of nations, developed, developing, and undeveloped, following the maturity, growth, and birthing stages. From a transportation perspective, all nations are developed nations. That seems to counter ordinary experience in undeveloped and developing nations, where service isn't of high quality or everywhere available. In what sense could this be true? The modern transportation systems were birthed in the developed world environment, energized development through companion innovation processes, and were deployed as development pushed and pulled deployment. At that time, they were deployed in the undeveloped world. They were pushed and pulled by the same processes. For example, there were early railroads in Africa and South America where development opportunities called for them. The difference between the developed and the undeveloped nations is that the undeveloped nations experienced Western-style development at the fringe, so to speak. The companion innovations that bloomed as modern transportation was created and deployed fit the Western situation very well. They took hold in only in limited ways in other places. The economic development programs that emphasize deployment of the systems successful in the developed nations and the undeveloped nations don't make much sense. Wolfred Owen argues equity is a basis for subsidized deployment. It isn't fair and just for the undeveloped nations not to have good highway and other services. That argument has merit. After all, their deployment has already been tried with limited success. What's needed is the development of services suited to the situations in the undeveloped nations. On the other hand, one could rightly view all nations as undeveloped in a transportation sense. That follows from observing that modern systems are not so modern. They were developed using once modern tools to fit once current circumstances, and they are obsolete today. Following Ferguson, the social developments in the developed nations cumulatively fed on each other and made progress occur faster. Following the life cycle model, though, as those developments play themselves out, the benefits from them experience diminishing returns, allowing less developed nations to catch up if they emulate, with shortcuts, the development path of the mature economies. Another useful quote is from science fiction writer William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. One example is M-Pesa, found in Afghanistan, Kenya, South Africa, and Tanzania, which allows sending cash from one mobile phone to another as a means of avoiding highway robbery. This innovation is driven by needs in the developing rather than the developed worlds. Similarly, development in the less and more developed countries differ more in the distribution than existence of transportation technologies and networks. 32.17. Policy should create environments for innovators to improve service. In the first paragraph of this chapter, it was said that our objective is to do better. Toward doing better, the discussion above sought to dig deeper. For example, it was said that we ought to go beyond how interest groups behave and be concerned about their structures and origins. It was said that the use of metaphors has an upside and a downside. Running through the transportation experience, there was an effort to understand policy in a generic fashion. Also, we sought to scope widely. For example, we considered both mode embedded and government policies, and we recognized logic copying, learning from experiences, and so on. We scoped to considerations of national points of view about the roles of government, growing out of the examination of life cycles, and mature status of today's systems. There was effort to scope to the energizing, redesigning, or rebirthing of systems. The development of more efficacious policies surely will be aided by our digging deeper and scoping widely. Scoping to energizing adds a dimension to policy, and our final speculation is that policy should create environments within which organizational and individual innovators can search for system-scoped service improvements. All the speculations bear on this task. For example, an environment ought to encourage the merging of hard and soft ideas. It ought to provide for rich problem and opportunity statements. We will not discuss the environment for innovation further because the topic goes beyond our policy speculations. Turning now to dysfunctions, recall that a large part of the improvement in the financial health and productivity of the railroads has been achieved by treating dysfunctions accumulated during the era of regulation. A similar sort of thing might be imagined for urban transportation. For instance, the railroads constrain their common carrier responsibilities, change pricing to a modified Ramsey inverse elasticity scheme, and rationalize network and institutional structures. Urban transportation systems might adopt similar changes. Some obvious dysfunctions in transportation service reside at interfaces, interfaces between local and regional roads, interfaces between transit lines, interfaces between airports and rail stations, and local transportation services. There are failures to balance costs and prices leading to overconsumption and underproduction of transportation services. 
There are also negative externalities such as air pollution and noise. A long list could be made of such dysfunctions. Such dysfunctions are targets for plans and actions. Planning for changes of this sort would represent an expansion of existing activities. A sticky aspect is that some social contracts might have to be modified. However, there is one policy question that should be mentioned. There is renewed interest in proactive policy, as opposed to what might be called enabling policy. Tools include subsidy, tax advantages, regulations, investment and demonstrations, and research and development, and the use of government procurement to create markets. How proactive should policy be? Considering national policy, our bias is very much toward emphasizing enabling more than enacting policy. Our view is that there are lots of latent ideas that would bloom if allowed. Something that has to be pulled, say, by subsidy is probably not a very good idea. Also, national-level programs suffer from one-size-fits-all, an emphasis on big programs and other ills. Let's put this another way. There are lots of enthusiasms out there. The niche market venues for trying out lots of things would seem to be at the local level, where local mercantilism is a motivating force. That suggests proactive local policies, and that is fine because risks, payoffs, measures of progress, objectives, and so on would be under close scrutiny. This close coupling isn't present at the national level. One may object to the author's position by claiming that some things, such as research and development, and massing large amounts of capital, might be most efficiently done at the national level. And one might add the notion that the national government could best recognize and utilize creative talent. As we have said, however, progress has come from new arrangements of old things in unsatisfied market niches. Research and development to improve systems and finding capital for the deployment become salient only after something worth doing is found. A second objection follows from the more than one road may lead to Rome observation. A national proactive stance is another road. That could be true, but it seems chancy at this point in time because national government activities and transportation have not nurtured the development of the traditions, insights, and talents that a national proactive program would require. One could say that they aren't present at the local level either, so the issue becomes that of where learning best takes place, in local laboratories or by national direction. Experience will show the way.